Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 27 of the Ask Historians podcast, and coincidentally, uh, the first uh, Ask Historians podcast of the year, the new year, 2015. Um, unless, of course, you are on you know, the Hindu or Mesoamerican or Chinese or Jewish or you know, Persian or any of the other calendars out there, uh, this is not the new year, in which case I wish you a happy early and or belated new year. Regardless, uh, we've been kind of uh, on a uh, East Asian kind of sojourn in these past couple episodes, and this is kind of kind of bringing to a close by talking about uh, language policy. So the way that governments and uh, various groups, you know, within uh, societies have tried to standardize and lay out, you know, this is how you should speak, this is how you should write, just do it. Also, we may have some repressive policies that we put in place, you know, or we may kind of tweak things here and there, but. You know, it's it's very easy when looking at the history of uh, you know as we have you know with the Mongols and with uh, the kind of modern you know the modernization of Korea uh, to kind of forget that underlying all of this is you know people talking to each other, writing things to each other, uh, communicating with each other, and that that itself has its own history. Uh, just the way that you know, people understand the way you're supposed to communicate with each other. So uh, hopefully uh, you'll really enjoy this. Uh, I am, uh, so I, I've called myself before a, uh, uh, you know, my background is anthropology and I've called myself a uh, true four field anthropologist in the fact that I'm fully conversant with, you know, uh, social anthropology, physical anthropology, archaeology, and pretending to know something about linguistics. So uh, this is, <laughs> this is very fun for me to talk to uh, Elon about these policies. And I hope that uh, you find just as much joy in this as I do. Oh, uh, it's also, this is a, a, one of our longer episodes, but it is kind of broken down into sections. We mostly spend time uh, talking about China and Taiwan. That's about the first hour, uh, but around minute 56 around there, we switch over to uh, Korea and talk about them till about like a, an hour and 20 minutes in, in which case we talk about Japan. Uh, and then kind of the last like five minutes or so, we're kind of rounding out talking about kind of uh, the, the politics of kind of identity and, and the way uh, language shapes that. So uh, if you want to skip around in the episode, it's very heavily uh, Sinocentric, China-centric, um, but we do touch on these other uh, uh, these other two nations as well. Welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Ask Historians podcast. Today, I'm speaking with Elon. Uh, he is uh, better known on the uh, actual subreddit as uh, kind of Kaylon. Uh, I don't actually know how to pronounce your, your username, but we'll be calling you Elon. Uh, I am, of course, Sean, uh, 400 rabbits on the site. And today, we'll be talking kind of about, uh, about a little more uh, abstract uh, topic than we usually do. Uh, we'll actually be talking about kind of uh, a, a linguistic topic about language and kind of how it relates to social and political policies and, you know, language planning within uh, East Asia in mostly sticking with kind of the uh, 20th century, but the, you know, historical background being historical background is. So, uh, Elon, before we get started, why don't you go ahead and tell us uh, a little bit about what got you interested in this subject? Yeah, so uh, so I'm a linguist. Uh, primarily, my, my major academic background is in linguistics and, and for, the, for the most part always has been. Uh, what I usually do has a lot to do with uh, minority language rights and, and documentation. And so then as part of this, uh, you deal a great deal with, with language policy and government efforts to both support the national language as well as uh, sometimes wipe out the local languages, sometimes support the local languages. So uh, just, just through my work with dialectology, I've gotten more involved with, with sort of the, the legal side of things, the government side of things. Yeah, and that kind of brings to the question, which I think a lot of people would ask is, you know, what is the kind of the importance and the significance of, of having, you know, a linguistic policy? I mean, because we know there are plenty, you know, multilingual, uh, multilingual states and multilingual people, et cetera, et cetera, like that. But, you know, I, I think, you know, because a lot of our user base is from America where, you know, if you know English, then there we go. I mean, it's a very right, monolingual yeah. state. So I don't, I don't think it quite strikes the uh, the same kind of chord, you know, although some people, you know, the question about, you know, English only kind of thing like that. But uh, that means the sure, whole yeah. policy. But, you know, but, I mean, we can kind of see why this would stir people's passions. But what what is the, what is the actual significance of having a, a, a single linguistic policy for a state? Well, I mean, I can sort of use myself as an example, right? So I, I live in Taiwan right now. Uh, I split my time between Taiwan and Shanghai. And in Taiwan, for most people, going back a generation, Mandarin was not their native language. They spoke either Taiwanese or they spoke Kaka or something else. And, and in Shanghai, they're likely going to have been speaking Shanghainese until more recently. Um, so for me as a Mandarin speaker, 
the fact that there is this single national language means that I can easily go through Shanghai, Beijing, Taiwan, uh, or you know different parts of of the Chinese speaking world and communicate with people. Uh, so things like get a job or uh, advance economically, get a better education, all of this stuff is is done in the single language as a way to enable people to have some sort of not just upward mobility, but mobility in general. I, you know, actually, it's a, it's an interesting point that you brought up the the idea of you know, people only now recently becoming kind of native Mandarin speaker, because I think mm -hmm. one of the misconceptions yeah. that we have about, um, you know, China and East Asia in general is that it's a very kind of, um, like, well, you know, kind of bland, I guess, if you're, <laughs> when you come down to it about right, yeah. in terms of linguistics, you know, you have like Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and there you go, you have, you know, almost 2 billion people when they speak, you know, three languages. But, you know, the, the fact that you're bringing up, you know, Cantonese and uh, Mandarin, you know, because I know a lot of people talk about like, oh, they're different Chinese dialects, but, right, you yeah. know, I mean, is that a, a misconception or are we really talking about different languages here? Well, so I guess, I mean, the first thing to address then is is what's a language and what's a dialect. And uh, I, I make a lot of people grumpy on Reddit when I tell them this, but <laughs> they, I won't stop saying it, is there actually is no difference. A lot of no people difference. on Reddit are grumpy regardless. Well, that's true. Yeah, I, they probably started out that way. Um, the uh, there's, there's no actual objective difference between when something is a language and when something is a dialect. So objectively speaking, like scientifically speaking, as, as somebody who's looking at linguistics, you could argue that English and German are both dialects of Germanic. You could argue that uh, American English, General American English, and you know uh, Southeast England English are languages within the uh, English family. And we don't say either of those two things, but that's really just a matter of convention and sociopolitical factors and not something that's actually based in any kind of objective scientific reality. So if we say, China is, well, Chinese is one language and Cantonese is a dialect of Mandarin or a dialect. That's fair and that's that's not wrong. Uh, but if you want to compare it to the situation in Europe, for example, where you have French and Spanish and Italian and we agree that these are different languages, then uh, on the same sort of scale of how fine we want to analyze this, Cantonese is a language, Mandarin is a language, Chinese is a language, uh, and so on. It's also a little bit more convenient this way just because there's so many dialects of Cantonese and there's so many dialects of Mandarin that if we just say, well, Mandarin is the dialect, then it, it misses out on a lot of the diversity that exists within Mandarin. So even if we were to say that, you know, Mandarin is a dialect, there, there's still sub-dialects below that, you know, but uh, yeah, yeah. You, know, you brought up the, the idea of, of Europe and, you know, I, you know, most people are familiar with, you know, Romance languages and things like that. Right. And, right. Uh, you know, you know the, the five languages derived from, from Latin. Uh, is that the kind of closeness we're talking about when we talk about, say, you know, Mandarin or Cantonese or any of the other, you know, Chinese sub-languages, I guess you could say? Uh, yes and no. It's it's sort of, in some cases, it's much wider difference, and in some cases, the difference is quite small. Uh, somebody who speaks uh, Hakka, for example, would not have so much difficult learn, difficulty learning Cantonese because they really are quite similar in, in phonology and just, you know, in, in general, they're much more similar feeling. So uh, Spanish and Portuguese, you know. As a yeah, Portuguese, yeah, or Spanish and Spanish Italian and even, Romanian, or, yeah. or something like that. Right, right. But then something like Mandarin, Mandarin is actually one of the most different just because it's gone through the, the greatest number of uh, sort of not simplifications exactly, but just changes to make it the standard language and to get it more widespread uh, in the sense. So Mandarin actually has quite different uh, phonology and, and, and features compared to some of the other languages. But if you take something like Taiwanese or um, Southern Min, well, just Min in general. So Min is a group of languages spoken primarily around Fujian province. Uh, it's the majority language in Taiwan. There's a lot of Min speakers in places like Malaysia and Singapore as well. Min is actually a much, much, much earlier branch off the Chinese language family than all the rest. So with the exception of Min, all of these languages developed from basically one or one language, we'll say, around the, the year 600. But Min actually broke off much, much, much earlier, and so is the most different. Uh, I So I'm fairly capable in three different Chinese languages, and still Min is just, I just can't do it. I, I don't understand what people are saying. Like, I, I can't follow the conversation just because the differences are much, much different compared to the others. Well, I, I think that's actually, I mean, well, before we, before we move on, because I want, I want to ask about, you know, kind of how... Uh 
especially how kind of Taiwan and, and the People's Republic of China have kind of managed their language policies, you know, over the years. Mm-hmm. But before you go on to that, I, I kind of want to ask, you know, do we have a similar situation in, you know, say Korea? Uh, and I know most people tend to think of Japan as kind of a monoculture, you know, it, right, you know right. even the Japanese themselves. But, uh, you know, do we have what we would call kind of different dialects or different even sub-languages in like Japan or Korea that we would, you know, kind of recognize as well? Yeah, uh, there's, I mean, and again, this is on sociopolitical terms, so it's sort of not something everybody would e- recognize as equally valid, but uh, in, in Korea, between North and South Korea, the differences are mostly things that have happened between uh, basically since 1945. So there's been a lot of English influence in South Korea, Korean that hasn't happened in North Korea. Uh, North Korea, Korean was actually originally based on the dialect of Seoul, even though they say it's based on Pyongyang, that's not actually true. So if you were to go back to 1945, there would be not too much of a difference between the way that people are speaking in Pyongyang compared to Seoul. Within, though, South Korea, you have a number of different dialects that are still mostly mutually intelligible. Uh, the, the sort of tonal system is a little bit different uh, from one to another. The only really significant difference is Jeju Island. So Jeju Island is the uh, the Hawaii of Korea, they call it. It's an island uh, just off the southern end of the peninsula where their dialect is uh, often called the language and, and has a lot a lot of differences compared to what's spoken on the continent. Uh, Japan as well. So Japan up in in Hokkaido, uh, they have the Ainu languages, though those are pretty much gone at this point uh, through you know colonization and, and other other efforts. Uh, but then down south in in the southern islands, you have the Ryukyu languages uh, or dialects, which are related to Japanese. They're Japonic, but are usually considered a different language as well. Yeah, actually, it, it's interesting to bring up, you know, the idea of, you know, a, J- a Japonic language family, because I know there is, uh, there has been kind of, and I don't know if it's been, you know, completely debunked or, you know, completely true, true, true but the idea that uh, Korean and Japanese are, are related families of languages. Right, yeah. The, uh, the there was a recent publication, I'm drawing a blank on the guy's name, but but there was a guy that published a book within the last couple of years who uh, was arguing that, yes, in fact, they are related uh, and that there is a, a Korea-Japonic uh, family. This is ignoring the Altaic theory. This is ignoring the, ignoring the other theories that tie Korean to Turkish, for example. But, yeah, and uh, actually, I, just to interject, I, I, I was thinking of the Altaic theory. So, that, you know, if people are familiar right, with that, yeah. that's, a, that's the older theory that these two related, you know, by way of... Turkish languages in a strange way. Right, right. So the Altaic theory is, uh, there's there's two versions of it. There's a version that includes Korean and Japanese, and then there's a version that doesn't include those, and it's mostly just like uh, Manchu, Mongolian, Turkic, these kinds of these kinds of languages. And uh, the, the macro Altaic, the, the view that Korean and Japanese are related to Manchu, for example, um, Altaicists will tell you this is a widely accepted theory, but in, in reality, I don't know anybody uh, who is not a diehard Altaicist who, who accepts this theory. Uh, in, in linguistics in general, people don't really buy into it, but it's kind of, it's kind of problematic uh, for someone in my position who's, who's looking at, for example, Chinese dialects, because you'll have a bunch of scholars who are knowledgeable people who know the situation, but are putting out papers on topics like uh, Altaic influences in Beijing Mandarin. And what they're talking about there is then not Altaic as formulated by the theory. They just mean miscellaneous other languages to the north that may be related, may not be related. It's just sort of a convenient shorthand. You know what I mean? So, uh, but yeah, generally the, the, the Altaic theory that includes Korean and Japan, people don't buy. And then the work that's been done recently to say that Korean and Japanese are, are related other than being part of Altaic uh, has also not been well received just because the the method of comparison and the way that these these scholars have gotten to this conclusion is not really sound academically. Well, I mean, I, I would guess it's it's more sound than you know early twentieth century uh, guesses that you know Japanese related to you know Zuni, which is a South right, yeah. language, you know. Yeah. But you know, I, I can see, uh, yeah, how it, you know. It, so essentially, what we're talking about is that uh, you know Japanese and Korea uh, and Korean are essentially as in the you know the mainstream of thought still very different uh I yeah. mean, are they language isolates really because i don't know if there's yeah they're, they're they're both isolates and isolates from each other well so japan like japanese if you want to include ryukyu as a language right as opposed to dialect then you can say well the the japonic family is an isolate and the Koreanic family is an isolate as well but then there are sort of languages within those two families depending on how you want to split things up Gotcha. So I, I now want to kind of swing back around to what we were talking about earlier and kind of uh, go back to China. 
uh, because, uh, you know, as you noted, you know, Mandarin, and as, I think as most people know, uh, Mandarin was not, you know, the single dominant primary language that it, it, it is now, um, you know, but how, you know, were there previous attempts in China to kind of nationalize a language? Many attempts, yeah. Um, there, there were, there have been attempts basically for as long as there has been a need to have any sort of uh, human migration uh, or you know bureaucracy over larger areas and things like that. Uh, so. The Chinese efforts in the People's Republic of China really started in the 50s, but before that in the 1910s, uh, particularly starting around 1913, Republican China, uh, now Taiwan, started to make those efforts. But even going back further, you have multiple efforts during the, the Qing uh, dynasty in particular as well that was pushing for a kind of unified language to be used for government purposes. And in fact, in Chinese, the word that people usually use to refer to Mandarin uh, is the language of the court or the language of the government. And that's to this well, day actually, what many people... Just to, to, to break in here, so the, the Qing themselves were, were Manchu people. So and they were they, were they native Mandarin speakers or had they become so after, you know, kind of uh, signifying themselves? Yes, I mean certainly by certainly by the 1800s, the 1900s, they were they were definitely not actually Manchu speakers uh, to the extent that they would have been early early on. Um, but most of their government system was not itself Manchu, and so there would have been a lot of people who were in the local governments throughout the country who were not Manchu, who did not speak Manchu, who might have had to learn Manchu as part of what they were doing. But but Mandarin at that point was still very much the the lingua franca. Mm -hmm. So, you know, do we see a unified effort effort with the Qing? And does that does that continue over into the Republican period? The well, so the the sort of the major efforts in the Qing came near the end, and this had more to do with with the teaching of the classics and the the literary language, which is quite different than the way anybody speaks. Uh, so, really, we don't we don't actually see so much for addressing the vernacular and addressing just sort of the uh, the 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 policy as it pertains to how the average Joe out in the provinces speaks until more into the Republican period. The, the Qing efforts had more to do with people who were applying to government positions or people who are taking the civil service exam, things like this. And are we, are we looking more at kind of a, you know, because, you know, there is, of course, you know, the written language, which I assume, you know, the, the, the characters, the, the Hansi, I believe they're called. Uh, yeah, Hansi, be, yeah. Yeah, can be, you know, just... It's the same written language, just pronounced in different ways. Uh, That's also actually a myth. Well, uh, <laughs> please, please dispel. Yeah. So the the idea, and this is actually a wide, it's a, it's such a widespread myth that not only do many Chinese people believe it, but the nationalist government in 1913, who put together the Ministry of Education Committee specifically for the efforts of language reform and creating the standard language, they didn't call themselves the Committee of uh, the National Language. They called themselves the Committee of Standard Pronunciation, because even they believed this idea that all Chinese languages are written the same and it's really just pronunciation differences. The reality is that they're really quite different uh, as far as the the sort of grammatical structure, sentence structure, the vocabularies are really different across, the characters that they use are quite different across. Uh, so if if I see, for example, written Cantonese, uh, and, you know, a, a newspaper article or something like that, it takes me all of two seconds to recognize that it's Cantonese because they're also using different characters, right? Um, so yeah, the, the idea that all of these languages are just pronunciation differences is incorrect. But the reason that this myth exists is because the standard written language, even in Cantonese speaking areas or Shahani speaking areas, the written language is standard written Mandarin. So when you go to someplace like uh, Guangzhou, which is a very much Cantonese speaking area, and you pick up a newspaper, you're not likely reading Cantonese, you're reading standard Mandarin that a monolingual Cantonese speaker will still read because they've taken, you know, literary, literary or literacy classes or, you know, elementary education, things like this. But to themselves, they may be pronouncing it with Cantonese pronunciation. However, it itself is not written Cantonese. It's actually just written Mandarin. That's the standard writing system that everybody can communicate with each other, no matter where they're from in the country. So each of these kind of uh, sub languages within the kind of the larger Chinese languages umbrella each have their own kind of variants on this this the, this you know, character driven script is, is what you're saying. 
Essentially, some some to greater degrees than the other. Cantonese has done really well to sort of um, not standardize exactly, but at least uh, propagate their their character variations and things like this. Uh, in Taiwan, Hakka has as well. Shanghainese has not done this so much. Shanghainese is a much weaker written tradition than than some of the other uh, non Mandarin languages. Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, how, really, how many different languages are we talking about here? And you know, are and you know, I assume we could, you know, if we really want to drill down, we can probably get like hundreds. You know, but you know, there may only be like a dozen speakers of one or something like that. But sure, yeah. How many how many major language or you know dialect groups are we talking about? If we're just looking at the Chinese languages, so the ones that are that are related to this older Chinese older Chinese language from which they developed, we're really sort of only looking at uh, eleven or twelve, depending again depending on where you draw the line. Because some people say, oh, well, these two things are actually the same language, and some neither. No, they're they're similar because of you know. Uh, contact with each other or, or similar heritage or something like that, but that they're actually different. So generally the number I go with is is between 9 and 11. So these are languages like Cantonese, Mandarin, Chinese, Hakka, uh, Taiwanese, like this. And at the time of, I, I think we'll just kind of, you know, set our standard from at the time of the origin of the Republic of China, that's the original Sun Yat-sen Republic of China, mm -hmm. you know, what kind of was the prevalence of speakers of each of these, because I can I can understand you know while the why the Manchu who had you know been you know gradually become uh, you know native Mandarin speakers would want to promote Mandarin, um, but was it really the dominant language at that point in this early twentieth century, or were there were there rivals you know you know did, did Cantonese almost become a, a standard you know the standard Chinese language. Right. Yeah. Uh, so that's also a, that's sort of a, a common story that you'll find people talking about on the Internet. And a lot of, you know, a lot of the, the Chinese language learners in their forums or the China history forums will, will point to this. The reality is actually Cantonese never really stood a chance. The uh, the original standard language in uh, this is 1913, 1916. This is the original uh, committee that's part of the Ministry of Education in, in Nationalist China, Republican China. They had uh, about 45 members coming from different parts of China. They each represented, you know, a different region or a different province or, or a different ethnic group or something like this, uh, ethnic group within within the Chinese still. Their task was to determine this national language and they took a vote. And so this is the famous vote of, oh, Cantonese almost became. The reality was Mandarin was actually well accepted as the standard by that committee because the Mandarin that they had voted on was one that took into account many different sort of regional variations or, or regional features in the language. For example, uh, there's a tone that doesn't exist in standard Mandarin of today uh, for the Beijing dialect, but which does exist in other Chinese languages uh, in give the us, South. Could you give us an example? Uh, it's actually a tone category, so it's not the tone itself, but it's basically uh, syllables that end in a consonant. So you'll see this in Cantonese, you'll see this in Shanghainese, and, and basically just not Mandarin, right? So a lot of the Southern, uh, so for example, like uh, Pak, like Pak might just be Ba up north, there is no uh, final consonant. And this is itself a category within the traditional tone system, but this is something that Northern Mandarin speakers don't have. So when they formulated this kind of artificial Mandarin that they voted on in uh, around 1919, I believe, uh, it included syllables with these final consonants that belong to this tone. And so the non-Mandarin speakers still felt that this was fair to them because it includes things from their language. And again, remember, even they thought that this was just differences in pronunciation. They were sort of themselves oblivious to the grammatical differences and the, the vocabulary differences and like this. So, so, so it, yeah. it sounds like, you know, it's at the same time that they're kind of saying, well, okay, now Mandarin is going to be the standard. They're also kind of uh, standardizing Mandarin by incorporating elements of, of other dialects and languages within uh, China at the time. Right, exactly. Yeah, the, uh, they, were, they were definitely trying to make concessions. They were trying to give people an opportunity to have their region represented in the national language. This is actually was itself pretty short lived. And in, in 1932, they basically said, okay, never mind. We're not going to do this. This didn't work because since it's an artificial language, there were no native speakers that could teach the language. And so the teaching of this sort of standard Mandarin until 1932 was really inconsistent. So you would have uh, Southern language speakers, this extra tone category, they would just pronounce the way that they pronounce it in their own language. Whereas in Beijing or up north where it didn't exist, 
but they still now have it in the standard, they would just kind of, you know, make it up as they went along, or they would they would kind of just uh, guess at what it should be. And so even the teachers weren't quite qualified to teach it because it's a language with no native speakers, right? So, so essentially they invented Chinese Esperanto. You know. Effectively, yeah. But it was, you know, it, it, that's actually probably really accurate since Esperanto itself is is very similar to Romance languages, right? And it's built upon this kind of, of framework. So yeah, no, I think that's 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 a pretty fair assessment. Yeah, so, I mean, who who was advocating for this? I mean, the idea of like, okay, well, we'll have one standard language and, you know, we'll make it Mandarin and then, we'll, okay, we'll, we'll incorporate some other things and et cetera, et cetera. We'll make it mm-hmm. kind of a universal standard Chinese. But, you know, were there major advocates for this policy or were there advocates sort of just saying like, no, make everybody learn Mandarin as it is? Or, you know, were there advocates who were saying, you know, well, we need to standardize Mandarin first, you know, or right. to, so, to yeah, so et cetera? Right. So early on, the uh, so this was the again the committee of, of uh, unification, committee of unification of pronunciation was their name. They were really sort of put together by the the Republican government because they were like, well, we we do need this kind of thing. And early on, they recognized the value of having a sort of lingua franca. Um, the government basically just said, we need this committee to do this, and so then the committee quite successfully to some extent, was able to to vote on these things. But it wasn't that there was one person, at least early on in Republican China, there wasn't one person who was really pushing for this. It was something that everybody kind of already agreed needed to happen. Now, the, the Republic of China uh, didn't, at least on the mainland, uh, didn't have a whole lot of time to actually enact its policies. Um, having, you know, I mean, right, a, a yeah. few decades there and, and before being basically uh, expelled over to uh, Taiwan. So... Did the did did the communist China under Mao, did the People's Republic of China, you know, did they inherit these policies? You know, did they change them in significant ways? You said that in nineteen what was it, thirty two, they basically said, Okay, we'll just we'll talk this one, you know, we'll we'll switch over to just this one version of, of Mandarin, that'll be the, the, you know, yeah, the yeah. standard. But you know, was specifically, that specifically, yeah, specifically on? the Beijing. Yeah. Yeah, the Beijing dialect, yeah. But right. was this carried yeah. on into communist China? You know, were there significant policy breaks that they had? Yeah, it's, well, it's, it's sort of interesting because what happens is in 1949, the communists take over and there were a lot of things that were attempted, like, uh, for example, you know, character simplification, which was successful to some degree, and, and you know, uh, phonetic script, which didn't really happen, but that was something that Mao also wanted. But for the most part, a lot of the official policies in the CCP, certainly up through the 1950s, were basically the same policies that Republican China also adopted or, or pushed for. Uh, even something like simplifying characters, that was something that in 1935 the, the nationalists tried to do. Now for them it was much smaller, they only had 300 and 320 some characters, um, and it only lasted for about six months before they withdrew the simplification. But you know, a lot of the sort of claims of like, oh the communists ruined the language and all these sort of things, it's like, well no, they were really just more successful at all of the stuff the nationalists were trying to do before them. So yeah, a lot of a lot of what the communists did uh, in the 50s when they were sort of just getting started with it, they basically were just readopting things the nationalists had already pushed through. Now, you, you just mentioned it briefly in passing, but you know, there was a, a there was an actual attempt to make a phonetic script as opposed to the, the you know, additional Chinese characters we know. Yeah, early on. So early on, Mao uh, wanted a sort of native alphabet. So there is there is a system that's actually used in, in Taiwan that is kind of it looks kind of like a uh, Japanese katakana to somebody who's not familiar with it. It's, it's kind of based on Chinese characters, but it's kind of an alphabet syllabary type system uh, that they use here in Taiwan. But aside from this, there was really an effort to have a pure alphabetic script. Uh, so like the English alphabet or something like this for Chinese, but something that was a native creation. Uh, and this was something that Mao was really pushing for very, very early on before before things got, you know, a little hectic over there. Uh, this didn't this didn't last too long. By 1958, they just adopted the, uh, the an earlier form of the pinyin system that they use now in China that's using Latin, Latin letters. But yes, they, they always sort of early on wanted to have a native alphabet. Yeah, and, and for those who are not familiar, could you just kind of briefly explain, you know, uh, the pinyin system and I guess, you know, as it relates to, uh, like, the older Wei Giles? <laughs> it's uh, it's easier. Yeah, Wei Giles is, uh, that's, that's purely subjective. Uh, pinyin's just what I'm more familiar with, so I don't particularly like reading Wei Giles because I always have to to think about it a little bit extra to remember how to pronounce it. But pinyin is basically a, a uh, Roman letter, Latin letter based 
uh, spelling system that is the way that people type in China. So if you ever wondered how do people type in, in characters, they're actually typing it out phonetically in this pinyin uh, romanization system. And then this brings up the character they can select on their computer for which one they want. Uh, pinyin is a fairly simple system just because there's only about 400 or so different syllables that can be written with it um, in standard Mandarin. But it's also itself is kind of a system of, of spelling contractions. So for example, uh, UI, if it's part of a syllable, would be pronounced way. But this itself is a contraction of W E I, which is also pronounced way when it's a uh, syllable by itself. So a lot of people don't really like pinyin because they feel it's inconsistent. Uh, it actually just has a bunch of sort of built in contractions that you have to learn through rote memorization. Uh, way Giles is a little bit different. They have different, basically, they just have different letters marking the same pronunciation. So if you look at, for example, uh, Qingdao, the beer, right? So T S I N G T A O. Uh, this is actually not Wei Jiao's, this is a different script altogether. But in standard Mandarin, in the pinyin script, this would be Q-I-N-G-D-A-O. It's the same pronunciation. They've just chosen different letters to represent the same sounds. Yeah, and I think most people, you know, the, the example I was thinking of was Peking versus Beijing. Kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's kind of the, the famous one there. But, so, uh, but to go back to the idea of simplifying the script itself, you know, at, at this point, yeah, I presume there may have been earlier efforts to simplify the script even before the nationalists, you know, or right, yeah. you know, even for the you know the, the Chinese, as, uh, the communists as well. But really, how complicated was the writing system at this point? You know, because I know uh, you know you hear people like say like, oh, to be fluent in Chinese, you need to know, you need to know like nine million characters, yeah, or something ridiculous like that. But it's actually ten million. <laughs> yeah. You've done well for yourself then. So, <laughs> right. and, and, you know, how how difficult uh, you know was the writing in complex and archaic and uh, was the writing system and what was the literacy rate at you know say mid twentieth century China? Mid twentieth century China, the literacy rate was not fantastic, but it actually, that was more of an issue of the education system rather than the complexity of the language. Chinese has a very strong uh, tradition of, you know, calligraphy and even very, very young ages teaching people calligraphy. And, you know, my friend's, you know, 10 year old child has phenomenal calligraphy even at 10 years old, because this is something that the educational system really, really stresses. So in the mid 20th century, literacy rates were, were fairly low, uh, but more to do with the fact that you know, universal education wasn't really available. People out in the countryside didn't have access to to good education, or simply just didn't have the necessity to have higher levels of education. Um, the idea that the script is, you know, impossible to learn if you didn't grow up with it, or things like this, is is not really true. Um, it's very systematic. It's um, like English spelling; it retains a lot of kind of archaic pronunciations that we don't use anymore, like the knife, the the K in knife. Uh, but for the most part, it's fairly systematic. It's made up of the same smaller components put together in each character again and again and again. So, you know, you do have to put some time into it, but it, it doesn't actually take, you know, a lifetime to be able to be literate. So since, you know, these are, you know, the characters are made up of, you know, kind of smaller components, I think you're saying is that, uh, so was the, were the simplification efforts kind of focused on a particular kind of group of, of characters or a particular, uh, you know, kind of idea of characters, you know, okay, let's simplify all the yeah, nouns, yeah. let's simplify all the verbs or something like that. It, it's sort of, it was more based to do, uh, more based on, on frequency of the words or, you know, the, the usefulness. So there's some characters, for example, uh, well, so it, just to give a really quick introduction. In many, many, many characters, you have a phonetic component. This is marking the pronunciation. And then you have a sort of semantic component, the thing that tells you what category the word falls into. So for example, the character for medicine, the, the radical, the semantic component is grass, because medicine traditionally is coming from plants. And so flower and medicine share this one component in common, because they're both things that get back to being plants, right? A lot of uh, words that have to do with speaking our language, they have a, a radical, uh, the semantic component that is the character for speech or for words. And so on the right side of the character, you might have the thing that represents the sound. And on the left side of the character, you have the thing that represents, generally speaking, what category the word falls into. Uh, many cases, the simplification, what they would do is they would just simply simplify the phonetic side. Uh, in other cases, what they would do is they'd simplify the other side, the semantic uh, side. So the word radical, the thing that is part of the word for speech and for language and for, you know, this sort of thing, 
that's what they simplified and they did it based on the calligraphy forms so many 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 of the simplifications that we see they're based on how people write that character quickly with a brush you know what i mean so does saying, that make sense you know, so it's like yeah like taking you know if, if everyone was writing in serif font before they said nobody actually writes in serif font you know kind of right take those right yeah kind of thing like that so but you know was this done all at once or were there kind of stepwise with like major i guess that you know you i guess they were putting out like you know official dictionaries and things like that so you right know, yeah so what's yeah. kind of the timeline of this the the major the most sort of successful uh first effort under under the the communists was in 1956 and they did do some revisions uh they updated that that list a little bit it's the official list of all of the simplified characters uh 1956 is when they really started uh, developing it. 1964 is when they published it. And it was about 2,200 new characters at that point. Uh, these are simplifications. In many cases, the simplifications were, were quite minimal. Like I said, it was just, you know, one small part of the character changed and, and a way that people were probably handwriting it anyway. Um, later on in the uh, in the 70s, in 1975, they tried to simplify uh, about 250 other characters with the plan to simplify about 600 more after that. This didn't last very long. They only uh, made it till about the 80s, the mid 80s, before this was just taken away when they decided, no, this isn't working. And and, yeah, was there a reason for the rejection of this, of the second round of simplification? Inertia. Inertia, <laughs> mostly, kind of yeah. Like, okay, we're, look, we've simplified enough, we're already writing it like this, kind of like that. Well, and also just, you know, you have to you have to disseminate this and you have to educate people about it. And by by the 80s, you know, when, when literacy was a lot higher and people were much more set in their ways, right? So if you're coming in in the 50s and you don't already have as widespread of an education system except for the elites, then it's not that difficult to say to someone who is completely illiterate, hey, this is the character that we use for this word. And maybe that character didn't exist before, but they wouldn't really have had that sense, right? Whereas by the 80s, people are, are more comfortable with writing, and, and so it's going to be a lot more difficult to get people to just, hey, you know you know that word that you've been writing every day for your life since forever? We're going we're gonna to change that now. And that's sort of a, that's a much harder sell. So, I mean, you had, you had to, to shift over, actually, to Taiwan, because you had mentioned that uh, some of these kind of early initiatives in simplifying the language and standardizing the language actually kind of started... Um, you know, with Republicans and even started in Taiwan itself. So how did, how did, you know, the, you know, the, especially Taiwan before uh, the, the nationalists and kind of Taiwan after the nationalists kind of, you know, parallel or, you know, diverge from these, uh, you know, the Chinese communist kind of uh, uh, reforms? Right. So, well, at least as far as simplification, Taiwan actually has a lot of simplified characters that are in daily use. Uh, and it's something that people will use in handwriting. And, and oftentimes you'll see it typed as well. The, uh, the the sort of national beer, Taiwan beer, they use simplified characters for their logo, uh, which caused quite a stir when they when they switched over to that logo because people felt like, well, this is, you know, uh, mainland culture encroaching on us and things like this. The reality is, though, the vast majority of people in Taiwan have always used simplifications uh, as they did in China before it became standard because it's sort of a, uh, if you can say, a colloquial way of writing characters. It's it's the local version of the character. Um, Taiwan, on top of that, then also has a lot of characters that are the result of Japanese variants. So Japan also has, uh, for, for the characters that they still use in writing, they have their own set of simplifications, uh, which they call the the new characters. And these are widespread in Taiwan as well. So, so quite often I'll see people here even today using Japanese simplifications in their writing. Well, that's, um, that's, a, that's kind of a good question because Taiwan was occupied by Japan for uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the better part of a decade. So, I mean, how did, how did that, how did, what, was, what were the Japanese language policies towards Taiwan? Yeah, well, so at least actually as far as characters, the, the, the official Japanese simplification came after Japan had already sort of done their thing in Taiwan. Uh, but again, they were sort of, they were already in wide use among average people as just a simpler way to write it. Um, speaking on policy in general, Japan actually had a, had a pretty, uh, I don't want to say good <laughs> policy, but the way that Japan enacted their language policy was certainly better than the nationalists did when they came to Taiwan. The nationalists basically said, okay, no Japanese ever starting now, done, and, and upset a lot of people. What Japan did was they sort of came in and said, okay, we, we want to teach people uh, to speak Japanese, but we can't just do it all at once because people will resist and reject that and it won't work. And so what Japan did is, is they came in and through different stages, there were three different stages of language policy, 
where in the first stage they sort of encouraged people to learn classical Chinese, to learn this written vernacular, which Japan was also using as their sort of official uh, you know, language for international diplomacy and things like that. A lot of times people were still writing in this classical Chinese in Korea and Japan and Vietnam. Um, the second stage of the occupation language policies was no longer allowing these schools that are teaching the classical Chinese and uh, you can t uh, you can still take Chinese language in the public school setting, but it's an elective. And then finally, in 1937, they were just like, okay, well, now it's banned. But by then, they'd already been doing this. You know, they started their policy in the 1890s, and so by 1937, people were much, much more comfortable with Japanese. The educated elites were using Japanese as their primary language for any sort of public interaction. So by 1937, when they said, okay, we're going to actually just ban uh, Chinese in any sort of public place like newspapers or, or government offices or even at your job, people were such sort of much more accepting of that by then because they were already, you know, fluent in Japanese for the most part. Now, um, when, when you say ban Chinese, are, you mean, are we talking, are we, you know, when you say fluent, are we saying that they are fluent in spoken Japanese or, you know, they're fluent in writing in these classical characters in Japanese? The, the writing in the classical characters in Japanese uh, is a thing, but it's not really a it's not really something that they would have been doing just because that was more it was a bit older, right? That was that was a bit earlier. Uh, so by you know by the 30s, the late 30s, they're speaking Japanese, they're writing Japanese, and they're still using the 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 kana, the sort of Japanese phonetic system, in addition to you know characters where where necessary. Um, but yeah, so they're 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 writing and they're speaking Japanese by the late 30s in Taiwan. And how much how much penetration of this was there? I mean, was this essentially, you know, you have fluent Japanese speakers, essentially, you know, they're they're the elites who are working in kind of these, you know, public arenas and uh, political offices or an upper class. And, yeah, yeah, you know, upper class or, or were there was, was there penetration of J uh, Japanese into, um, you know, other social groups? Yeah, in fact, so I I mentioned before that I wouldn't really say the Japanese policy was good in Taiwan. A big reason for that is they were actually pretty terrible towards the Aboriginal population. Uh, so Taiwan has a you know millennia old uh, Aboriginal population that speak Austronesian languages, so related to you know uh, Hawaiian or Maori or, or or like this or Tagalog in the Philippines. Um, the the Aboriginal population actually suffered pretty significantly under the Japanese occupation, and and they were much more actively prevented from using their languages. Uh, so, you know, I, I actually know a few, uh, probably in their 80s now, Austronesians uh, that live near my city, uh, who I've gotten to know. And, and for, you know, for many of them, they grew up speaking Japanese to each other because they would go to school and Japanese was just the language. So they would speak Japanese at school or to each other. And some of them even today speak Japanese to their, you know, to their spouses. Uh, but then when they go into the city, they would speak Hakka because it's otherwise a Hakka speaking region. But then when they were talking to their parents, they would speak the Aboriginal language. But then after 1945, they had to learn Mandarin. And so, you know, the, the Aboriginals really suffered under all of these different language policies. And so I would assume at this point, you know, they're kind of multilingual or at some, Shock, some extent. Yeah, shockingly yeah. multilingual. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but mind blowingly you, proficient. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned it was it was Hakka uh, speaking here. So you know, do we see uh, major kind of thing? Because you said that the the Taiwanese kind of like Min subfamily is the a further di you know further diverged in the past from the, the mainland Chinese languages. You right. Know, but do we have um, major Chinese dialects? You know, to put that in air quotes, dialects uh, on Taiwan as well. And you know, it, it, I'm mainly thinking you know kind of in like early 20th century because I know we have an influx right, of yeah. mainlanders later but you know early 20th century yeah the uh so so the aboriginal population was pretty much it other than a few less successful attempts by the dutch and and even less successful attempts by the spanish to colonize taiwan uh the 16th century or thereabouts the well, sorry the 1600s uh 17th century saw a large population of min speakers coming in from southeast china and around this time is also when the Hakka speakers came in just because at this point in in the qing the economy was really bad down there there were droughts there were famines the you know agriculture wasn't sustainable uh, at this point in time. So that's about when Taiwan started seeing the population of uh, Chinese speakers who were not Mandarin speakers. Um, so by the end of the 19th century, you had about, you know, 80, 85 percent of the population are Min speakers. You have about 15 percent, uh, 13, well, 13 percent who are Hakka speakers and then a very, very small percentage that are uh, Aboriginal language speakers. 
And this was just the result of all of these people coming in from the 1600s and on uh, from just the most nearby areas of China. Hakka speakers have always sort of been outnumbered uh, wherever they've lived in, in their history. And, you know, Taiwan is certainly no exception. Even today, it's probably only about maybe only about uh, 12 percent of, of people would identify as being Hakka. And then within that group, many are actually not as proficient with the language, especially the younger generations. You know, in the early 20th century, under Japanese occupation, we have this kind of promotion of Japanese uh, above all these kind of, I guess, to make, you know, Japanese the the national language of Taiwan. Um, But what happens after World War II? I mean, uh, is there, you know, is there a rolling back of this? Is there an adoption of, you know, men as a national standard language or what happens then? Yeah, 19, 1945 to 1947 was a pretty bad time in Taiwan's history. Uh, what happened was, so the the Japanese handed Taiwan over to the nationalists. Uh, this is before the nationalists have fled uh, fled the mainland before before 1949 when the communists took over. Uh, between 1945 and 1947, the Republican government basically came in and outright banned Japanese, any Japanese, which again, really hurt the Aboriginal population because now they had all of these different positions in government and all these jobs where they were using Japanese as their language. And they didn't speak any Chinese language because at that point you didn't have to, Japanese was it. Because so when the nationalist- century century of, of Japanese. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Well, and again, they, under the Japanese, really had no option but to learn Japanese because even, you know, in many cases in the home, they were forbidden to speak their languages. So, so the nationalists come in and basically anybody who is, uh, you know, an Aboriginal Taiwanese person, uh, for the most part, ends up losing their position. And so they're out on the street. The uh, the elites can't speak Japanese anymore. They're really upset. Um, and, and the Chinese, when the, when the nationalists came in, they really just sort of botched it and got everybody really angry with them really, really fast. So then by 19, uh, 1947, there were otherwise anti-government uprisings and there was uh, it's called the 228 incident it's kind of a substantial point in in Taiwanese history uh, this was sort of the the end point of uh, the nationalists really poorly conceived efforts to quickly Chineseify Taiwan and get it out of the sort of the the Japanese sphere of influence uh, it was it was really just mismanaged uh, all the way along uh, they, they really didn't which is another reason why I say that Japan's language policies were enacted in a much better way is is that's largely in comparison to how poorly the nationalists did it in the 40s. Well, I mean, yeah, it sounds like that the nationalists basically said, OK, you know, no more Japanese, ignoring the fact that, you know, there'd been almost two generations of people who and, and particularly the people who are actually serving in government and, and the people they would need to administrate Taiwan at that point were Japanese speakers. Yeah, yeah. And when that's a that's a trend that you see multiple times in Chinese history. Like so one of the you know, going back to the, the UN dynasty, one of the issues was that they came in and, and sort of didn't allow the people who actually knew how the government runs down south to stay in government. It was the same sort of thing here is like the people who were most equipped to keep Taiwan running smoothly were suddenly not really able to do that job because of these sort of oppressive language policies. Yeah, so, but the nationalists only had a couple of years to, um, you know, kind of uh, mismanage this language policy in Taiwan before they themselves were basically kicked off uh, mainland China. And at that point, you know, in 1948 or, you know, roundabouts there, uh, you know, we have the influx of you know, millions of, uh, of mainland Chinese into Taiwan, if I'm correct. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I assume that kind of um, did some sort of alteration to the, uh, the, the language status at that point. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do we have, uh, you know, were these Mandarin speakers, Cantonese speakers, you know, whatever? So this is actually kind of interesting. They were they were Mantanese speaker Man, Mantanese. They were Mandarin speakers, and they were Cantonese speakers, and they were Shanghainese speakers, and they were whatever else speakers. Uh, but Taiwan's actually kind of there's there's a guy that uh, he's at Tsinghua University named Cao Fengfu, and 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 uh, Cao is doing work these days in the idea of Taiwanese Mandarin as a post-Creole language. And and so what's meant by that is basically you had all of these different people who are coming from different parts of China. They moved to Taiwan. The government has already set up these Mandarin language policies and they've brought in a bunch of Mandarin teachers from the mainland by this point, uh, 1946, that was a big deal. And so the people who are Cantonese speakers who are not fans of the communists come to Taiwan 
and learn Mandarin. They're not really bringing Cantonese with them. They're not bringing Shanghainese with them. And so what happens is you have all of these different languages, plus the huge, huge influence coming from the Taiwanese, the Southern Min language that's still the majority here, uh, plus all of these other features of their own regional languages. So that Taiwanese standard Mandarin, even today, has carried a lot of these influences. Uh, and, and so you can really tell you know, if, you, if you're someone who's learned Mandarin in China, if you're from Beijing and you come to Taiwan, very quickly you start to notice that the, the grammar is not quite right and the vocabulary is not quite right beyond just regional differences, right? Beyond just the accent, beyond just the sort of more, the stuff that you would expect just from being separated by time. There's all these other things that have come in and changed the, the linguistic landscape here. Yeah, so that's, that's actually kind of an interesting question. So, I mean, how, you know, what was the standard uh, the standardization practice of uh, in Taiwan, you know, because it sounds like a bunch of people uh, from China speaking mainland China came over uh, speaking a, a wide variety of languages. There wasn't one that could really dominate. So they basically said, OK, well, I guess I guess we'll fall back on the standard. Then that kind of um, got wrapped up in kind of the, the local uh, influence as well. But I mean, you know, presumably there were kind of, you know, government efforts to standardize this and, you know, promote forward, you know, this kind of standard Mandarin. Yeah, there were there are actually quite a few efforts, but actually the thing that the thing that made the biggest difference was the compulsory military service, because early on uh, in in Taiwanese history, the uh, well, you know, in, in Republic of of China Taiwanese history, Mandarin was the language of the military, and since everybody has to do their military, you know, two years, three years of service, uh, up until you know even now, people have to do this. That was the point where you are sort of getting socialized in Mandarin and Mandarin is becoming the standard. Now, granted, you're not really taking, you know, Mandarin classes or have Mandarin homework as you're doing your military drills. Uh, so this, too, then affects the form that Mandarin takes of the people who have then gone through the military service, right? Um, so, it, so it still ends up being a little bit different than what the standard was originally taught as, but it's still very much Mandarin. It's still very much identifiable uh, as such. Um, but yeah, it was, it was it was really sort of military service that solidified Mandarin's place in, in Taiwan. So are we talking about solidification of written and spoken? Because I, I, the other thing I want to ask about is that it seems like most of the character simplification efforts in uh, the, the PRC came, you know, kind of, you know, after it had become the PRC. Uh, so was there a similar kind of simplification of the, the writing in Taiwan as well? Uh, sort of, but not, not really. So what, what was going on is in the, uh, the teens, the 19 teens, there were a lot of efforts to vernacularize the written language, right? So instead of what, what used to be used is this classical Chinese was a, uh, archaic sort of intentionally, uh, opaque kind of minimalist writing uh, that has has caused headaches for, you know, classical Chinese learners throughout its history, I'm sure. Um, and instead of writing in this sort of overly poetic way of writing, there was this, this push to just use the vernacular. What happened was they still ended up having a lot of classical influences in the vernacular. It wasn't actually writing the way that they speak, like, you know, like, you know, chat room speaker or whatever on the internet today. Um, but it was much closer to the way that people actually spoke. And this had happened before the nationalists really came to China. It happened both in Taiwan as well as in in uh, in China. The, the Chinese efforts towards this are a bit more well-known, and there's, you know, Lu Xun and, and um, sort of well-known uh, authors of this period of China. But actually, Taiwan was also going through this, and so there's a there's a whole, uh, there's actually a department at my university that is specifically the Taiwan uh, Literature uh, studies studies uh, department, uh, specifically looking at this kind of thing and the history of, of the vernacularization of literature in Taiwan. Actually, to swing back around to our minority language speakers, uh, so how were they now being treated under this kind of the, the you know the new nationalist regime regime in uh, Taiwan? You know, because you know they'd been bumped out of government and now they're being told to right, okay, yeah. Now you need to learn Mandarin and like oh god again another language so uh, <laughs> so. Uh, and also the fact that, you know, unlike, you know, because in at least in mainland China, you have this, you know, huge population of people who speak Mandarin and, you know, there wasn't right, such yeah. a thing in Taiwan. So, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, kind of the, the obligatory military service, but, you know, were there other kind of efforts to bring people in to saying, OK, hey, let's let's speak this one standard Mandarin you know style? Yeah, the, I mean, there, there definitely were. Uh, but again, oppressive efforts, not not really encouraging efforts. So for example, uh, limiting what languages can be used for broadcasting, uh, things like that. So so now we have uh, 
Today we have the Council of Indigenous Peoples, we have the Council of Oaxaca Affairs, and these are sort of government-backed uh, offices that try to uh, disseminate literature and educational materials and all this other stuff and make sure that these minority languages are being taught. But it wasn't until 1987 that they repealed punishments for using non-Mandarin languages. Up until 1987, the expectation was you're going to speak Mandarin, you're only going to speak Mandarin. Uh, so this goes for being at school, this goes for, you know, obviously we can't control what you speak in the home, but we'd really like to kind of, you know, this kind of attitude uh, up until the late 80s. It wasn't until 93 that you could start broadcasting the languages, and it wasn't until the mid 90s that there was any sort of government uh, efforts to create the council to standardize the uh, curriculum for these other languages. And to swing back over to the mainland, I mean, do we see similar kind of a resurgence or acceptance of minority languages in mainland China as well? Well, yes and no. Part of the issue with mainland China is, so officially there are 56 ethnic groups in, in mainland China, with the largest being just Chinese. Uh, the reality is that this, this 56 number is completely you know, made up. It's, it's, it doesn't really reflect the reality. There are uh, 100, 200, 300 different minority groups that are sort of self-identifying uh, unique ethnicities, each with their own language, in some case multiple languages and, and the like. So one of the issues in China is that there's just not sort of official recognition of these groups as a group, uh, the recognition of whom would really help and go a long way towards towards uh, encouraging the minority language loose. There, there are efforts by the, the communist government to uh, recognize and uh, encourage minority languages, uh, a big prerequisite for these languages being that they have their own script. So there's a language called E, uh, Y, I, down in the southwest in sort of Sichuan Yunnan area, and they have their own sort of script that is a, it, it kind of, it, it kind of looks like children drawing stick figures. It's, it's sort of that level of complexity. I, I don't mean that to, you know, to, to be down on, on the writing system at all. It's just, if you see it, it's it's like ovals and kind of zigzag lines and circles, and, and it's, it doesn't look anything like Chinese, but it's still kind of a, a similar idea and a similar development of starting out as pictographs and moving on. And, and so for them, they're, you know, their they're efforts at having this, this language are more more protected in a way because they do have the written form. But then there's hundreds of languages in China, minority languages, uh, you know, related to Thai or Hmong or other languages like this that, that don't really have much support or recognition and, and are, are disappearing quickly. Yeah, so what is, I mean, what is the policy? Is, is it like uh, Taiwan before, uh, say, 1987, when it's saying, you know, you can't speak Yi at home, or you can't speak, say, like Uyghur out in the public or something like that? Right. The, the law is that any broadcast that's being done at the national level has to be done in Mandarin. Uh, and this has actually been kind of contentious recently as well, because just last year or so, uh, a very well-known Shanghainese broadcast had to go off the air because the the broadcaster switched from from a regional uh, Shanghai only broadcast to a satellite broadcast, which meant that now it goes to all of China. So now they can no longer do anything that's not Mandarin. You you definitely do find regional broadcasts. Um, they're also kind of newer. The last uh, I'd say twenty years or so. Um, in these different places, you'll find these broadcasts, but but they cannot be national. They they have to be based in this one region. Uh, and in addition to that, that also means like movies and everything like this doesn't really get to see any sort of minority language use. Uh, if you're, you know, if you're a speaker of Uyghur or if you're a speaker of, of Zhuang or uh, Cantonese or whatever, and, and you go to other parts of China, then yeah, most definitely you can use these. Uh, and people do, right? People are still communicating in Cantonese if you go to South China or still communicating in Uyghur in, in you know, wherever there are Uyghurs living throughout the country. But the the use of these languages in more uh, distributed forms isn't really supported. Now, I want to swing back in time and then swing over to Korea and, and talk about the, the standardization, the language policies there. But before we, we move away from China, do you have any kind of concluding thoughts on, on uh, you know, the both mainland and Taiwanese uh, Chinese language policies? <sighs> I mean, I think it's, it, you know, it's, it's, it's really important just to keep in mind that these are two very different governments uh, running two very different sort of national policies. And so what you end up seeing is quite a lot different, but never really enough that if you speak one, you can't learn the other, right? Um, they're, they're still easy to communicate between the two, uh, but it's still sort of... You know, it's good to keep in mind that these are just coming from very, very different places and have sort of resulted in a very similar end result, but through different, very different channels. So... All right, so uh, I think we'll go ahead and move on to Korea. 
So swinging around and talking about uh, language in uh, the Korean Peninsula, uh, you know, I think most people are familiar with uh, with Hangul, which is the you know the written script. Uh, you know, we talked a little about how you know the Korean is a kind of a language isolated by itself. But uh, I mm -hmm. think the interesting thing is that uh, you know Hangul. You know, because previously, you know, everybody almost in in kind of the East Asia and even down to Southeast Asia used you know Chinese characters. But right, yeah. you know, Korea has this very distinctive script all by itself. You know, but what, you know, I, I don't think people really know kind of almost how. I think this is something that it's it's either more recent than it actually is, or more ancient than it actually is. So when does Hangul actually come about? So it's it's actually newer and older than than a lot of people think. <laughs> so Hangul is officially around the 14th century is is when Hangul was officially made. Uh, and and the story is that this is King Sejong all by himself, being brilliant, being awesome King Sejong that he is, and and creating this script uh, that is the the most perfect script because it's actually pictures of what your tongue is doing in your mouth. Uh, the reality is that this in fact was not you know, coming out of thin air, but but the, the Hangul writing system is in large part based on, or is believed to be based on the, uh, I'm going to butcher the pronunciation, but the, the Pogspa uh, writing system, which is sort of a more stylistic looking kind of version of Hangul. That's that's not accurate. That's just what it looks like. But uh, Hangul definitely takes some some cues from the Pogspa system. Uh, there are, of course, other things that are you know unique to Hangul, and it's, it itself has also undergone a lot of changes since the 14th century. Um, but the thing about Hangul is it actually didn't become popular and widely used until the beginning of the 20th century. That from the 14th century to the 20th century, uh, it was basically not used except for a few key areas. Uh, it has a long history of being used for fiction and people writing, you know, uh, pulp novels in Hangul. But for things like newspapers or, or things like this, it wasn't really until the 1890s that people started using any sort of Hangul in uh, nonfiction or you know newspapers things like this so was there a, a geographic uh, localization of it you know was it you know mostly people in say seoul or some other particular place in the korean peninsula that were you know in this pre 20th century that was you know using hangul well yeah so the distinction is is really more along class lines and education level because if you are well educated and if you're reading the newspaper for example right if you're reading the newspaper then you're already going to be having some level of education because the newspaper is in chinese characters um so the things like fiction which would have a wider audience and wouldn't necessarily require years and years and years of, of schooling of specialist topics to to understand uh you know hangul will have more use and more appeal of people with with slightly lower education levels but even then you still have to be educated to be literate right so but yeah, so it's not necessarily <laughs> so it's geographic. Kind of a middle class language or writing system. Sort of, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's something that they would use to teach uh, pronunciations of Chinese characters, right? So if you're if you're reading uh, even some of the earliest earliest uh, written records that we have in Hangul, you'll still have a lot of, it's called mixed scripts, right? So it's Chinese characters and Hangul mixed together, which was really common even until the 1990s. Um, what you'll see is next to the Chinese character, is the small and off to the side is the pronunciation written in Hangul. So it will still let you know, right? It's still an educational aid, but it's not something that people are putting out their doctoral dissertations written entirely in Hangul. So this isn't, you know, when you say mixed script, this isn't like how, you know, uh, Japanese mixes in kanji with, you know, katakana and hiragana at the same time. It's it's literally more like a, a, a Hangul gloss. On sort of. Well, no, okay, so there's two different things that are going on. One is actually just pretty much exactly the way that you see it with Japanese. Um, if you look at even academic papers written today, you'll still see a lot of mixed script because it's, uh, what it is, is it's Hangul for grammatical particles and for grammatical words and things like this. And then for technical vocabulary, you'll see it written in Chinese characters or if the Chinese character helps clear up some ambiguity because the word could have two different meanings depending on, right, because of the pronunciation, uh, then they might write that in a Chinese character. So that's the one thing that's much more like what you see in uh, with Japanese. The other thing, though, is for early on for, you know, for educational purposes or for some of the earlier things where they're trying to teach people Hangul, um, you'll see it with mixed script, like I described. But then in addition to that, next to the characters, you'll see sort of a uh, not a footnote exactly because it's attached to each character, but you'll see the pronunciation. If you look up uh, even just like the Wikipedia article on Hangul, uh, there will be a picture of this very earliest written 
uh, record that we have of Hangul, and you can see next to each of the characters is sort of like the 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 you know pronunciation aid. Gotcha. So yeah, I mean, I use the term gloss because I'm used to thinking that from my own studies. You know, where you know you had the the creation of these kind of uh, pictorial documents of, of right, yeah. you know of uh, you know in the Nahuatl style, and then you'd have these you know, Spanish explanations of what they actually meant there. But yeah, yeah, as, but you yeah, well, and you, well. you do see that as well, actually. So I mentioned before, there's the classical writing, right? People are writing in classical Chinese, but the the classical Chinese mm-hmm. of Japan and the classical Chinese of China and of, of Korea might be slightly different. So they're actually documents. Uh, Japan is the one that's coming to mind first is documents teaching Japanese people how to reorganize the sentence structure to make it be what they're used to reading. So it's like a a study guide of how to read classical Chinese in China for Japanese people. (laughs) <laughs> if that makes sense, I, I, I think I've just confused myself. But, but you know that that sort of idea of there are still differences. Whereas with the mixed script, it is really just this is Korean. We just use you know a lot of Chinese vocabulary. We're going to write that with characters. But the stuff that isn't, we're just going to write it with Hangul, and it's fine. Now you mentioned that fiction was the way that this came about. So you know you had mentioned you kind of explained that it was you know okay this is a this is something that was easily accessible to people who were literate, but you know not you know upper class. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, so fiction is sort of the the first place that it really had a strong foothold. Uh, newspapers started to use Hangul in the 1890s, um, and and part of this too was under under Japanese influence uh, and under officially Japanese occupation. Uh, later on, there was a sort of a strong push by the Japanese to get China out of Korea's uh, sort of, you know, get, get basically remove Chinese influence. Because even though Hangul existed since the 14th century, people didn't really use it because Chinese culture was still admired and was still seen as like the higher culture and the thing to emulate. And so we want to use Chinese characters. So actually the Japanese kind of trying to push Korea away from China and vice versa um, is, is, was a, minor but still significant contributing factor in getting people to start using Hangul more uh, because they they sort of early on fostered this notion of Korean identity as separate from China, right, as part of their their sort of big push. Yeah, and presumably um, that was for their own kind of political aims as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. The, uh, the idea was that Koreans were ancient Japanese, basically, right? So there's this idea that, that Koreans were Japanese, they were just a different branch of Japanese lineage, and so we need to sort of encourage their culture because it is a subset of our culture. Uh, and this obviously backfired for them through the various different, you know, re- protests and, and people resisting Japanese occupation, but it still did have a, have a sort of uh, contributing factor to getting Korea away from the sort of Chinese influence that they'd had for centuries. So do we see the same kind of like uh, three part step uh, language policy in Korea that we uh, under the Japanese that we that we see uh, that we saw in Taiwan as well is kind of like first encouraging yeah. those classic Chinese characters and then drawing them away? Yeah, effective. Yeah, people people like to do language policies in threes. It seems. Yeah, there's there's definitely uh, the same sort of stages and and the events that kind of are taken as the point the the turning point from one period to another. Now, of course, things obviously happened more gradually and it took time for things to propagate through. But, you know, like in the, in the early 1900s, they shut down all the Korean schools. So uh, because many of these Korean schools were unable to teach Japanese effectively. And so they, they sort of were kind of shut down. The 40s saw the end of all Korean language newspapers, with the exception of like the one that the government used to tell people what was going on, because they thought, well, we don't want people to use Korean. But the reality is many people do just use Korean, so we still have to tell them what, you know, what we want them to think and what they're doing and things like that. So the government mouthpiece official newspaper could still be written in Korean, but other ones could not. And so uh, and when you say written in Korean, are these newspapers that are being written in uh, Hangul or these are being still being written in the Chinese script? When does, when does the Hangul finally kind of surpass the, uh, you know, kind of kick out the old, you know, exclusive reliance on Chinese characters? So by the time that the government, the Japanese government, uh, cut out uh, Korean newspapers, by then a lot of them were using either Hangul or mixed script. After the Japanese occupation, uh, North Korea banned Chinese characters completely, but South Korea kind of went and 
continued to use them all the way up until about the 1990s. I want to say it's like 1995, but I'm a little a little hazy on the date that that the major newspapers kind of just decided that they weren't going to do that anymore. There is one newspaper, uh, Jolson Ilbo, which is the um, the sort of conservative newspaper, uh, and they held on to Chinese characters a little bit longer. Um, nowadays, you'll only see it as like abbreviations. So they'll use one character as an abbreviation to mean China and another one as abbreviation to mean Korea or America or whatever. Um, you know, but, but largely it was in the 90s that they, they completely stopped using large amounts of Chinese characters. And so these, these, uh, these newspapers then are being published in uh, you know, the Japanese mixed kanji kana script or sort of yeah the so the ones that at that point what they're doing is they're doing the mixed scripts but with a large amount of hangul so it's kind of a tripart mixed strip so it's it's kanji kana and uh, hangul all at the same time there's so it's not it's not kanji or kana uh, for writing Korean, but it's a similar. So what I what I said about that earlier is that it's like a uh, it's a similar kind of situation where if you see written Japanese, you see that it is the native script plus the Chinese characters. So for the Korean newspapers, it would be Hangul plus Chinese characters in this mixed script. There's actually another uh, kind of Korean writing where what they would do is they wouldn't use any Hangul. They would use characters, either repurposed Chinese characters or characters that the Koreans themselves had created to stand in for like Korean grammatical particles or, uh, you know, suffixes or things like this that, that were supposed to represent the sound. But yeah, by the time the Japanese shut it down, they were using Hangul and Chinese characters together for the most part for most of these newspapers. And so, you know, we saw in Taiwan that there, there were certain, you know, ethnic minority groups that were that said, OK, great, uh, Japanese, we can adopt that. You know, at least it, at least it's a standard language that is, you know, has a little more prestige than our own kind of uh, to suppress my own languages. But do we see a particular social or cultural group in Korea that, uh, you know, kind of gloms on to Japanese? I mean, you you do have people who are sort of either, you know, sympathizers, Japanese government sympathizers. Uh, a lot of the people who were in the early uh, independent Korean government had some ties or education in Japan. Uh, it was pretty common that they would take people and uh, have, you know, well, first of all, there's already a large ethnic Korean population in Japan. But then in addition to that, you would have people who were in Korea who had been chosen to, for example, go to Japan to get military education or things like this. So you definitely had a lot of people at that period who were either outright sympathizers with the Japanese or just people who saw that they themselves could profit at it, regardless of whatever they felt about the nationalism or things like this. Um, but otherwise, for the most part, Korea was much more unaccepting of the occupation. And, and Koreans in general, there were a lot more efforts to try to keep it from happening. And um, yeah, so they were, they were sort of much more I don't want to say uh, historically equipped, but in the case of the Japanese occupation in Taiwan, they sort of just had this kind of rocky situation going on in the first place, and they were sort of not really quite... Uh, it, it sounds like there were already people who were, who were disenfranchised under the previous yeah, you know, exactly, uh, yeah. you know, rule, and then you know when this new people came, you know, when Japan came along, it gave them a route to become um, franchised. You know, right, exactly. The opposite of disenfranchised. Yeah. Yeah, so Taiwan started out as just a, a neglected province of the Qing, and then it was Japan after that. And then it was the nationalists, right? But but it wasn't really sort of a thing with its own kind of culture and identity and whatever to the extent that Korea was. So that in the uh, early 1900s, when, when Japan was moving towards officially annexing Korea, which they did in 1910, uh, the Koreans were already, you know, appealing to at the the Second Hague Convention and appealing to Western powers to sort of present prevent this from happening. And the the Western powers just kind of turned a blind eye and and just allowed it. So yeah, just early early on, the Koreans were sort of positioned to resist the Japanese and and started out very unsatisfied with how things were going. So, so it sounds like there was more of a, a kind of a, a lighter, uh, well, a, a, a less a, a kind of a shallower. Um, coding of, of Japanese language over the Korean Peninsula. So it seems like there was, you know, Japanese and I guess uh, I assume the, you know, the uh, official publications and such and being taught in schools, but, you mm -hmm. know, but yeah. everyone's speaking Korean everywhere else, essentially, you know, but, or do we have yeah, efforts yeah. to kind of, you know, punish or stamp out the use of Korean uh, language in public or in schools? Yeah, but this again was only starting in 1943, right? So, so you got punished for speaking Korean in school, as of 1943. So in Taiwan, 
in Taiwan and Korea, you see a lot of the same sort of uh, um, Japanese uh, language policies going on. But in Taiwan, they had more time to kind of uh, set in uh, because they sort of started earlier on. And, and with Korea, Koreans still had some prominence in schools in the late 30s and early 40s. And then shortly after Japan was gone. So there was sort of there was less time for people in Korea to kind of acclimate to Japan, uh, Japanese being the language. Right. Now, so yeah, it also seems that, you know, uh, the Korean language is being, you know, at this point, very, very, very much tied into kind of uh, efforts of nationalism. So do we see kind yeah. of um, those two influences coming together and kind of commingling? Yeah, definitely. I mean, so the, the language is very much seen as a, a symbol of the culture and a symbol of Korea as a entity, right? A Korea as Korean rather than just simply a, a sort of you know, unhappy province of Japan. Uh, so yeah, definitely a lot of the, a lot of the early efforts of, of, uh, opposition to the occupation were also very closely tied into the idea of, of linguistic nationalism as well. And so, and do at the same point, do we still have, you know, cause, uh, Hangul is, as we mentioned, uh, it goes back to the, you know, the 14th century, you know, and just yeah. Sejong, you know, but do we have efforts to modernize it and, uh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. The uh, well, and so a big issue was the pronunciation of Korean has changed a lot since the 14th century. Surprise, surprise, as all languages do. And so shocking, there were shocking. actually a lot of years. Yeah, I know, right? Changes, yeah. <laughs> who, who knew? Um, so actually, there were there were a lot of efforts to sort of uh, modernize it and get the pronunciation to or get the writing to match the pronunciation. So there are letters in Hangul, uh, for example, a, a kind of a dot and a triangle that that don't exist anymore. Um, they only show up in the old records, but nobody uses them because they symbolize a, uh, a pronunciation difference that just doesn't exist anymore in the modern languages. Uh, and so much like, you know, Webster with, with Webster's Dictionary and Changes in American English Spelling, Hangul went through a very similar kind of thing in the, uh, the, the 1930s mostly, actually. Yeah, actually, I want to swing back and kind of, you know, because you had mentioned this earlier about the idea that, you know, Hangul, but, you know, uh, it's supposed to show, the, the characters themselves show where yeah. the tongue and lips are positioned. Is there, I mean, is, is there really any truth to that? Yeah, I mean, yes, there is in some cases. Like, so the, with with a sort of very stylized uh, a depiction and with a sort of very rudimentary idea of of what your tongue is actually doing in your mouth. But yeah, there is, there's the, uh, for example, the, uh, the N, the one that does the N sound is a sort of picture of someone's tongue if they're making an N sound and looking to the left. Um, obviously this doesn't work for a lot of them and there's sort of a, you know, if something is going to be aspirated, so like T versus the, the, the difference in the character is they just add an extra line and that marks aspiration. So there's a lot of this just sort of stylistic and there's a lot of stuff that maybe at one point was more representative, but as, as Hangul has developed over the centuries, you know, some of those things have been, uh, modified out or just simply it was stylistic to begin with anyway. So you would also mention that, you know, this standardization of, you know, I guess, you know, modern Hangul was being done in the 1930s, which, of course, was, you know, during uh, the Japanese occupation when they were trying to kind of, you know, suppress this. Yeah, um, yeah. So were these kind of like underground efforts, you know, were people, you know, passing around samadats of, you know, Hangul dictionaries? Yeah, the uh, in fact, the uh, one of the more famous cases is the uh, the guy that was editing and compiling a dictionary in the 30s that was supposed to be sort of a standardization of Korean pronunciation dictionary ended up dying in Japanese prison because he was arrested for having done the dictionary. So, I mean, how did this change in the kind of the, the immediate post-war period, you know, like, you know, immediately after the end of uh, the Japanese occupation in 1945? Um, do we have efforts to um, uh, de-Japanify, if that is indeed a word? Yes, yeah, much like Taiwan, uh, after 1945, Japanese language materials were just banned. North Korea, South Korea, just banned. Um, and, and Kim Il-sung actually went a step further and banned Chinese characters as well in, in the late 40s. Uh, but yeah, definitely after after the end of Japanese occupation and uh, in, in the 40s in general, there was a strong effort to just further Koreanify the peninsula and, and get, get rid of a lot of these sort of foreign influences. Do we have... Uh, official bodies set up to, you know, promulgate, uh, you know, the the use of Korean characters of Hangul, uh, and you know, and do we also see the standardization of the 
um, spoken language as well? Because I know you said that North, you know, uh, North Korea had adopted, you know, the Pyongyang uh, dialect, which is actually, you know, as you said, scare uh, quotes, so, yeah. yeah, exactly, a Seoul dialect. Um, but do we see efforts to standardize both the written and the spoken language at this point? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so this, a lot of this actually happened more in the 80s with the, the Ministry of Education in Korea, but the uh, they, they published uh, sort of revised standards at different points throughout the, the past 50 years um, where they are, first of all, standardizing the orthography. Uh, there are some, for example, there's some silent letters. Like if you say the word walk, W-A-L-K in English, in many dialects, you don't pronounce the L. Uh, Korean actually has the same thing. So the word for chicken uh, has an L in there that doesn't really get pronounced, but it's still written. Um, and, and all of this ended up getting standardized by, by the South Korean Ministry of Education. Um, they also published sort of the rules of what dialect is deemed the standard. But again, this wasn't until the 1980s. Before then, it was sort of, you know, the Seoul dialect is the de facto standard because it's got the highest population and it's sort of the prestige area anyway, uh, kind of the same way that in, you know, Japan, Tokyo kind of always was this prestige dialect, even when it wasn't officially. Yeah, well, um, I'm thinking about kind of, you know, when you, when you bring that up, I'm thinking about how uh, we have kind of a standard American English, which is kind of most people going to be like Midwestern English, um, but even though it's not necessarily Midwestern English itself, but there is kind of this idea of okay, well, that's how most people speak, so let's just kind of go with that. Right. You know, so yeah. it's a, it's the least regional dialect, I guess you could say. Yeah, exactly right. So the, yeah, there is no there is no official language in America, right? States have it, but there's certainly no official dialect of English as well for the states that do have English as, as the official language. So yeah, definitely, it's just kind of eh, it's already here. We just accept it. It's fine. It wasn't like. South Korea had suddenly decided, okay, you know what, everyone, we're going to be speaking um, the equivalent of like, you know, Brooklyn, New York, English. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. Now, and, and actually in North Korea, they did have the standard, but the standard was the Seoul dialect until 1945. And they just said, yes, the Seoul dialect. So it, it ended up uh, now just changing names and was referred to as the Pyongyang dialect, sort of as a, a part of like the creating the history, right, of the of the regime. Um, but yeah, it wasn't really until, for South Korea, it wasn't really until the 80s that things started to kind of get the rules and and the sort of codified standard of, of what is the right way to say this, what is the way you shouldn't say it, which dialect has the best way to say it, and things like this. Do we see kind of a, a parallel um, actions going in North Korea? Because, you know, you talked about, you know, they ban all the uh, Chinese characters. Do they replace them with new characters they're creating? Or do we nope. see, I guess what I'm asking is, is there a linguistic divergence between North Korea and South Korea since the, uh, the end of yeah, the war? Yeah, there is, absolutely. Uh, in fact, if you, if you escape from North Korea and go to South Korea, and if you can get to South Korea, which which is you know problematic enough uh, the South Korean government actually has sort of a uh, kind of like a halfway house that, that you can stay at and they give you some amount of money and and part of the the thing that they do there is extra support for you is give you language classes to teach you how to sound less like a North Korean and and, and use some of the vocabulary and you know teach you things for example like a cell phone maybe you didn't have a cell phone in, in North Korea and so they'll teach you how to use it but then in addition to that they teach you the word for cell phone which is handphone handphone Right. So I mean, Korean and South Korea, they have this kind of English loan for a lot of different words that in South in North Korea, they just don't have. Right. They don't have all of the influence of, of these other languages that have shown up in South Korea since the Korean War and sort of foreign presences there and, and things like that. And um, do we see kind of the retention of, you know, because you said in, in the 1980s, South Korea, um, you know, kind of standardize the uh, the written language as well. Do we see kind of the preservation of older forms of Hangul in North Korea as well? The the uh, the pronunciation reflects more of a historical sort of uh, heritage, I guess you could say. The the um, so Korean has a lot of words that are borrowed from earlier stages of Chinese languages, and in North Korean pronunciation, a lot of this is more apparent because South Korean has sort of dropped letters at the beginning of some syllables, and just as sort of as as people's speech developed and changed over the years. Uh, the the vocabulary in North Korea for stuff that isn't directly affected by communist ideology as well tends to be slightly older vocabulary. Uh, but again, this is just simply because the dialect is kind of fossilized more and it doesn't have all of these other influences that would otherwise, you know, initiate changes. Now, I want to uh, put that on the background now and, and head over to Japan um, because, you know, it's been kind of on the background at this point. 
Um, but I, I think the question I have for you with Japan is is really just kind of is it as much as kind of a uh, a monolingual state as we think? You know, we talked about you know there's the Ryukyu languages as well, but I mean you know we're talking about like oh Seoul dialects and variations in spelling and things like that. You know, uh, do we see the kind of um, variants variations in dialect and regional dialect and uh, uh, script in Japan that we do uh, in as we've been talking about these other regions? You, you do, but it tends to be more... The, the way that it is most noticeable to, to a lot of people is that the, the intonational system is different from place to place. So the standard is the, right, the Tokyo dialect, but if you go to a place like Kyoto or Osaka in the, in the, uh, the Kansai region, they actually have a slightly different system of intonation patterns, and it comes off as more just like salt of the earth kind of, you know, laid back kind of. Uh, at it. Well, and this is also part of part of the culture of that region it tends to be this way as well. So it's sort of projecting both ways, but it's 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 seen as almost more musical i guess you could describe well, it right have, so people yeah, a friend of mine is actually uh, from japan she always talks about like uh, osaka bon uh, yeah, being yeah. just kind of like cool it's cool yeah it's like this sort of like chill laid back yeah definitely and so that's sort of the biggest difference is that the uh, so it's a, it's called a pitch accent system right and so some scandinavian languages have this and uh, shanghainese is this way and some korean dialects uh, and the idea is that it's not a tonal language in the sense that chinese languages tend to be tonal but rather just that the the stressed syllable has a higher pitch and the stressed syllable between dialects might be a different syllable from one to the next and so yeah so that when people think about uh, the equivalent of uh, someone from osaka speaking they should really be thinking of kind of like uh, the Swedish chef. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's not quite accurate, but <laughs> if it helps, yeah. <laughs> Um, but you know, how, when do we see the, the standardization of this Tokyo dialect? I mean, I would assume it is um, when Tokyo was the capital. But uh, you know, do we have major efforts um, to kind of standardize language? Yeah, in the 1700s, the late 1700s, the Kyoto dialect was sort of the standard, uh, not officially, but it was just, you know, assumed because that was like the culture place, right? Uh, and it was it was really the Meiji Restoration that made the Tokyo dialect uh, the standard. Of course, it wasn't called Tokyo then, but that that's sort of when the shift officially occurred. Uh, and that's also the, the Meiji Restoration, especially in the like 1860s, 1870s, uh, and so on, is when a lot of the reformation occurred with Japanese. Um, again, just like in China, there was the effort to kind of vernacularize the writing and get it to be more similar to the way that people actually spoke. Uh, there was also push towards internationalization with the language and, and include, be well, at least be more, more open to not loan words per se, but words that represented foreign things like telephones and banks and, and things like this. Um, was, and, I mean, was there also the idea of uh, instituting a whole new, you know, like Latin scripts? Not, not as much. Uh, there were definitely people who were kind of pushing for this, but it never really, you know, it never really had a chance. Um, but yeah, there's, there's always been people like eight, 1870s mostly. Uh, one guy even wanted English to be the official language of Japan, and these are, you know, <laughs> seems there's, a there's, far-matched. yeah. I mean, these guys at this point, they're just their footnotes, right? They're not, they're not people who had much support even because obviously, you know, none of that happened. Um, Instead, what happened more more officially is in the early 1900s, uh, people sort of addressed like, well, maybe we should get rid of Chinese characters, or maybe we should try to standardize what do we do as as the preferred writing style, and you know, like in English, don't say ain't. Well, it's not because ain't is something people don't say. We just kind of agree that it's not something we should write, uh, and sort of codifying these kinds of rules. Um, and this this was more in the early 1900s that this that this was going on. Do we also see kind of, you know, because we're seeing the standardization of, you know, of Japanese in, in this kind of like immediate uh, Meiji era kind of thing. But we do, I mean, do we see as uh, Japan modernizes, are they also kind of starting to purge out some of these Chinese characters in exchange for, or are they simplifying themselves? You know, do we have a particular style of Chinese characters that are distinctive to Japan because they've followed a different trajectory from, you know, say China or Taiwan or Korea? Yeah, definitely. This is this is right after World War Two. Uh, they they did their first sort of script reform phase. So it's just under two thousand characters. Um, but it, but it wasn't just the simplification. It was also just saying these are the characters that you're allowed to use, right? So so a lot of countries, for example, they'll say you know well you can't name your child this because we have a list of approved words that you can name your kid. And, and a lot of a lot of countries have this kind of idea, uh, and as well in in Japan. And the idea was we're going to give you about you know, 18,000 or 1800 characters that are 
acceptable characters. Um, they since have changed this in the eighties. They they made it uh, like just over two two thousand, um, and they even have revised this as recently as twenty ten. Um, but yeah, in general, they've 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 done this kind of idea of we don't want too many Chinese characters. Here's the ones you can use. Here's what they should look like. That kind of idea. And how, I mean, you said that they've kind of um, accepted some uh, kind of loan words as well. And, uh, you know, my understanding of, of Japanese uh, languages, um, I would say, and somewhere between poor and non-existent, <laughs> my, my understanding is that there's, there's, in addition to kanji, there's two syllabary scripts, you know, one, yeah. which, is, one which is explicitly used to write foreign words. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, do we have a standardization of saying okay, this needs to be written in? I, I forget. I forget if it's katakana or hiragana, whichever one it is. But you know. Yeah. So yeah. This one. So so katakana is the one that is now mostly for foreign words, and and hiragana is for uh, either Japanese words or or words with uh, Chinese origin. Those get included in there as well. Um, the the uh, the usage of katakana actually was not always relegated this way. Uh, there, it was sort of at one point more of an official kind of government script, and and so it's gone through some usage changes as well. Um, but the the idea of it being well, this is for foreign words, and this one isn't. This is sort of more a matter of convention that that is well spread rather than something that that I'm aware of a specific yeah, and, government. And, when, and, you know, and is this like a fairly recent? I mean, how far back do these does this separation of the two syllable uh, scripts go back? The uh, well, so the 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 hiragana, the sort of more swirly one, is a a cursive script right it's 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 more of a um uh what's the word i'm looking for um well well so anyway so the the difference between these two goes back a ways but mostly just as a matter of like casualness or formality or things like this it wasn't necessarily like a uh an intentional uh split between the usages of these so much as just like a almost like a prestige difference what I want to do is just kind of uh, ask you a couple of uh, kind of general questions about the idea of, of language and standardization. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we have been talking a lot about how states have been using, um, you know, standardization of languages, both as kind of to say like, oh, just kind of to clean things up, to have a single language you can use for, you know, popular, uh, you know, uh, broadcasts and official government reports and such like that. But I mean, at the same point, we are really talking about kind of uh, a question of identity. So um, to kind of swing back around to China as well, I mean, how do we how do we look about the kind of efforts to Mandarinize, uh, you know, mainland China as kind of forming a, a singular Chinese identity? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely that's definitely a sort of intended side effect. Uh, the you know, the obvious things are it's 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 economically beneficial. It is uh, it's good for the, the people to have this idea. But of course, it's also very good for the state because it's some extra level of being able to to spread out the influence and to sort of unify people to Chineseness rather than having any sort of like regional identities as the as the primary identity. And this has worked to some extent and it's it's not worked to some extent. And there are still a lot of regional identities and you still have a lot of people who get very upset when they're when they're, you know, Cantonese broadcasts get canceled or things like this. Uh, but yeah, definitely it's 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 something that has contributed significantly to this idea of of Chinese nationalism. And are, are we still seeing kind of the evolution of uh, these kind of standard scripts? I mean, it seems like, you know, Japan has kind of standard itself, standardized itself, you know, uh, you know, starting back from the Meiji era. So it's had a long time to kind of congeal and conform. But, you know, we're talking about, um, you know, South Korea doing its major language reforms in the 1980s. Uh, you yeah, know, yeah. Or, uh, you know, an ongoing projects going on in uh, China. So how much are these languages still kind of in flux? You know, do we have any ideas? I mean, are there major issues that people are saying, okay, well, well, we need to revise the script again, or we need to change some, you know, uh, right, standard right. pronunciation, etc. So, I mean, so with Chinese, it's kind of interesting because in recent years, it started to go the other way, where more and more people are using traditional characters again in China because it's either, you know, for their logo, they think it looks more classical or things like this, or you know, you've got you've got a bunch of language purists um, who who I know uh, quite a few through my work in in sort of dialect preservation in China. Uh, every once in a while, I get an email from somebody, and it will either be written in Cantonese, which <laughs> which is somewhat problematic for me, or they will write their emails where 
where it's kind of a mixture between traditional and simplified characters where it's a traditional character when the, um, if there's, for example, you have two characters that used to be different characters but had the same pronunciation but very different meanings and they simplified into a single character. And so you see people who are sort of resisting that kind of thing just on on kind of uh, uh, conservative grounds for, for protecting the language and the culture. Um, there are people who are still advocating for further simplification or for ditching characters entirely uh, for, you know, for on the grounds of literacy or things like this. Um, it's sort of not seen as necessary because the emphasis that the education system does put on the written characters means that, you know, by 13, 14, you're as literate as you need to be to be a 13 or 14 year old because you've now granted you've spent a huge number of hours to get there. Um, but at least by that age, you're sort of where you would be expected to be. Um, but the other thing too, is it's just like, it's, it's seen as a, piece of the culture and it's something that a lot of people don't want to get rid of and and the notion of ditching Chinese characters well that is Chinese culture that you're trying to get rid of is is the attitude a lot of people have so the chances of those being successful certainly the way that attitudes are right now uh, I, I would be shocked to see any other major uh, simplifying script reform happening in the next 30 years in China at least thank you so much for talking about uh, talking to us about you know language policy and kind of the history of you know, how we write the way we write and the talk the way we talk, assuming that the we that we're talking about is, you know, over on East Asia. Um, but uh, thank you for this kind of interesting look into uh, this topic. Yeah, thank you. I, I hope everybody was able to stay awake. <laughs> and thank you, as always, the audience for listening. Uh, as much pleasure and joy as I get out of doing these and uh, talking with the interviewees and giving them a chance to kind of expound upon uh, the, the topics that they love and enjoy and, you know, in, appreciate having a captive audience in the form of you, uh, the podcast listening audience. It, we really do uh, enjoy bringing this to you and, and sharing this information with you, and we hope you enjoy it just as much as we enjoy making it. So coming up in two weeks, uh, we're going to end our, our travels around East Asia by tearing ourselves away to the far away exotic land of Alaska. So uh, I will be talking to the Alaskan, uh, who is a uh, he's a journalist up there, editor, uh, historical society, former president, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We'll have a little biography of him uh, in, at the start of that show. But uh, yeah, he brings a massive, massive amounts of knowledge to basically anything that happens in Alaska. He, uh, he he knows a great deal about it and is willing to share it with you in a very interesting, entertaining way. Uh, we're going to be focusing in on uh, a series of natural disasters, actually, and and kind of what they can tell us about uh, the history of Alaska and how it's changed over the past century or so. So we'll be looking at a 1912 volcanic eruption. Uh, we will also be looking at the uh, the famous uh, the gnome sled dog run. Uh, we'll be looking at the, uh, the the earthquake in the 1960s that uh, you know just was very devastating and one of the largest earthquakes ever. Uh, and we'll finally close out by talking about the Exxon Valdez oil spill. Uh, so in the, we'll, we'll tie those up together, these vignettes in there. So I'm very excited about that episode as well. And I hope you'll enjoy it. As always, if you like the podcast, uh, tell friends, tell your mother, tell your parents, tell your dog. Uh, if you don't like the podcast, don't tell anyone at all. Uh, but do if you if you want rate us and review us, uh, rate and review us on iTunes. Uh, again, if enough of you do that, then we apparently win some sort of prize, and then we'll pass the wings onto you, and then we can buy an island and live together for a while. I don't know. No, none of that is true. Uh, but it is a pleasant fiction. It just helps us get uh, more listeners, and then you have more people to talk about uh, when you know you're, you're discussing. Like I had this, I heard this amazing podcast about you know ancient uh, language policies in the 20th century and no one will look at you like you're some sort of weird historical freak which you're not you're beautiful anyway uh in two weeks uh we'll see you then you've been listening to the ask historians podcast for more history like this visit us at reddit.com slash r slash ask historians and ask over 100 historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know in history Find us on Twitter as at Ask Historians and subscribe to the show on iTunes. Or visit askhistorians.libsyn.com. Thank you very much for listening and join us next time on the Ask Historians podcast. Mm-hmm.